All right. Welcome back, Brett. Okay. Welcome back. Why don't you introduce? Steve? Yeah. So I'm excited for the second episode with Brett Kaufman today as our guest for our Free Zone podcast. Dan, one of the concepts that has transformed, I think, you're thinking about the program over the last couple of years is the who, not how concept and the idea for those who are not familiar with it, although I don't know how anybody's not familiar with it who's listened to any of these podcast series is about thinking about what your unique ability is and what you really need to do. And then rather than try to figure out how to do everything else, figure out who you need to do everything else. That's my interpretation of who, not how, Dan. Um, And one of the things that I think is most unique about the model, because it sounds to many people like just delegation, is it's not about delegating down, it's about delegating up. And this idea of who is better suited than you to do the things that you're trying to do. And one of your breakthrough exercises that you just asked us to do that I thought would be a really great way to kind of segue into our conversation today is why you're a great who for other people. While other people might want to partner with you or collaborate with you, rather than always looking at who you need to Mm -hmm. collaborate with to get what you want done. Can you kind of break that down a little bit and then maybe walk us through how that we might apply it in both what Brett and I are doing with our communities, but how you're thinking about it for strategic coach. Steve, in the previous podcast, we talked about that there's kind of a participatory democracy kind of happening in a lot of different industries, different areas, a lot of it enabled by technology that allows people who've got an idea, who've got talent just to get together, regardless of what status they have in their community. And I was saying, you know, going way back before we had the who, not how concept, entrepreneurs used to say, well, where I live, you know, I live somewhere. We just don't have great people to hire here. And I said, well, I find there's great people everywhere. The problem here, maybe they're not looking for you. So I said, who do you have to be that great people would want to come and talk to you? Okay, so in the who, not how context, just updating it to the present time, I'm really good at certain things. And there's some areas where I haven't met my match. One thing is spotting people's unique ability. I think I can talk to somebody for about a half hour and I'm pretty close to where the center is. And you can just tell by the energy that they talk about certain things and don't use energy when they're talking about other things. So my feeling is that the thing that you love to do most, the thing that you do best, is where you have the most energy. And the activity itself gives you energy. It doesn't use up energy. My mother told me when she was 75 that I had this when I was six or seven years old from reports of adults who would talk to me, and I'd keep them talking for a couple hours when I was a kid. So the thing about who, not how, is that it tells you why entrepreneurs don't grow. And the excuse is they don't delegate. And I said, you know something? For an entrepreneur, I think delegation is just about the worst how in the world. You have to create what you want to delegate. Then you have to teach the person. Then you have to manage the person. Then you have to monitor the person. (laughs) And then... Probably somewhere along the way, you probably have to fire them. Just the worst set of hows that any entrepreneur can have. But finding somebody who's really got skill in an area that you don't have, that all you have to do is tell them what the goal is, and they say, I know exactly what you're looking for. That's really enjoyable. Yeah. What do you think it takes for someone to fully grasp how much better it can be by thinking about that? delegation differently? Well, tell me your experience here. You know, I mean, tell me your experience. Well, what is the thing that you've most dreaded about? And Steve, we've been together for 23 years since I first met you. What do you dread the most? What do you hate the most? What drains you the most about being an entrepreneur and growing a company? Yeah, I mean, managing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, you just outlined three things that it's like, wait, I got to teach them. Then I got to follow up and then I got to ask how it's going. I mean, the underlying operating day to day. Yeah. You have to motivate them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from yeah. my experience, and I have to say that, you know, we're probably preaching to the choir here, but the who, not how, and the unique ability and the time management, those learnings for me when I came into coach were 
transformative because I was very much in the how. I started a business with a big what. I was the who wearing all the hats, doing all the hows. And I was on the verge of wanting to quit. I thought, you know, even though I was having a lot of success, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to do it. And, you know, when you kind of start to apply those things, I think for me, it was the experience of seeing them apply that had me just wanting to just only do that. Once you get into unique ability, once you understand what it's like to find a good who, once you start to have that experience, you can't go back. I mean, now it's like whoing up everything, right? Mm -hmm. And only being my unique ability. When something's not my unique ability, I have no interest in going there at all, where before I felt like I had to do it because if I didn't do it, I didn't know you know, how else it would get done or how it would get done. Mm -hmm. So Brett, let me ask you a question because we're dealing with this in thinking about this as we scale our operation because we're thinking a lot more about who's than how's. We have a few different groups. We have a impact advisory board. We have a, a fellows program. We're now launching a venture partner program. Where do you think the line gets drawn between what you're willing to who out and what you need to keep in to your organization? If you do think there's a, a line. Well, you know, I can tell you that what I'm doing is really kind of hooing myself out of being an operator of any business ever again. You know, really what I'm going to end up doing is being a investor advisor coach to all of the well, businesses. Well, and a visionary too, Brent. And a visionary, right. Yeah. And what yeah. I, you know, provide as advisor coach is vision, is experience, it is connection, it is tools. It's a lot of things, right? You can drive a tremendous amount of value, you know, internally versus externally, I think it's kind of up to each individual, you know. I look at everybody on our team as a who. So, you know, we're not delegating. We have a self-managed company now where people are in their unique abilities and we hire who's that are going to be in their unique ability. So there's a kind of a who, not how inside, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of collaboration that's happening outside. You know, mm -hmm. we outsource marketing, we outsource legal, we outsource finance, we outsource fundraising with the crowd fundraising. We are starting a lot of new businesses in collaboration. Every time I have an idea, every time I have a vision, it's automatic outside who, new co, somebody else is operating. You know, I'm just there to make sure the vision comes to fruition. We've had lots of conversations because we do the podcasts and we have a lot of coach events and we talk about it. My sense is that your proper role is the explainer, the contextualizer, the protection of the vision. Okay. So I'm just noticing, you know, I have writers now. So last year in the last 12 months, we produced seven books that have my name on it as the author, but I didn't really, really do any of the writing. But not necessarily employed by Strategic Coach Inc., right? That's the big... No, I mean, the writer of the quarterly books is an outside writer. He's an outside writer. The thing that I protect most is not the words. Like, I don't change his words at all. But I said, you have to get the idea here. This is a really crucial idea. And it's a pivotal idea that if you don't explain it right, the idea doesn't come through. We're just completing the book is at the printer right now for Zooming Ahead. And I said, Zoom is not about communication. Zoom is about transportation, that you are actually somewhere else. And nobody's traveled as much in their life as they have over the last 12 months, except physically you didn't go anywhere. You just transported yourself to another place. And I said, this is actual transportation, but there's no regulation. There's no taxation. You're here, three clicks, you're there, and that's it. So anyway, I had to really zero in and say, you know, this is the crucial idea. You got to get this idea right. And I think every entrepreneurial venture and every entrepreneurial innovation, there's a pivotal idea where you're suddenly shifting things to an entirely new way of doing things. And I think it's the lead entrepreneur's role to actually protect that pivot. It's interesting to think about an organization built this way. I think back 
15, 20 years ago, it was really novel to think about building a remote first organization, one that didn't have an office, one that operated in the cloud that used collaborative technologies. It was frowned upon to not go into an office and to not have people sitting together nine to five. And now, obviously, especially in a post-COVID world, there's lots of massively mm -hmm. you know, transformational, multi-billion dollar businesses publicly traded that are proclaiming to now be remote first, especially post-COVID and not putting people back into an office. Mm -hmm. Do you suspect this is one of those kinds of shifts where 15, 20 years from now, there will be organizations with equity value? Because it's mm -hmm. I'm not talking about small businesses. I'm talking about real big businesses built without the idea that employees are needed to ascribe equity value to it. But the collaboration machine is at work with lots of who's doing the work? So I use two terms. I use teamwork inside. I use collaboration outside just to differentiate what I'm talking about. But in both cases, you're looking at unique ability of the individual. Okay, so in coach, we never call our employees employees. We call them team members. And I said, you know, there's only two things you have to get right here when you work for a coach. You got to take your unique ability as seriously as we take it. In other words, I take your unique ability seriously. The big thing is that you have to take it as seriously as I do. And then the other thing is you have to be really good at matching up your unique ability in teamwork with somebody else's. Those are the only two things you have to remember. You know, we have 70% of our team members have been with us for more than 10 years. 25% have been more than 20 years. I said, there's just something you got to get right. And I think that we're talking now with you with Startup Health. The whole idea is you don't give $10 billion to a single R&D laboratory and expect them to solve the problems of humanity. You create 360 separate R&D labs and you create a funding mechanism that allows each of them to innovate, you know, one, two, three, or four innovations a year where a big lab would, you know, it produce some interesting stuff, but it would be a monopoly and it wouldn't go anywhere. So what you're creating is really a very, very innovative network of people who are passionate about making a breakthrough in, in part. Well, that's a novel idea and it has to be protected because that differentiates you totally in the market. Whatever differentiates you totally in the marketplace, that's the idea that the entrepreneur has to protect. Brett, how do you think this applies in the real estate world, especially when it seems like historically there have been a whole bunch of who's coming together to build projects or finance projects? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that's still going to be the case. I mean, you know, who's are necessary because to do a real estate project, you know, especially from the ground up, it requires people with very different unique abilities. The people that know how to finance it are not the same people that know how to construct it. And you can kind of, you know, extrapolate that to every aspect of it. So by nature, it is very much a collaboration. And to the Zoom, you know, point, I think there's a lot of debate right now as to what does that mean for corporate office? What does that mean for go forward? Are we going to go back to in-person? You know, can we solve all of our problems, you know, by Zoom? And I think what it does really for me, I think the end result is it really works to our benefit because what is going to get eliminated is soulless real estate. You know, if you have a building with no character and no value to the individuals other than just putting them in a room, then Zoom can do that. But if you're providing an experience, if they come to that and they can feel a certain way, they can learn something, they can be a part of something. You know, Dan, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the bullshit factor, being together having some margin time, just having time to be with in connection. Mm -hmm. All of that, I think, is if you're facilitating that within a physical asset, you're still going to have a lot of relevance go forward. Otherwise, Zoom is amazing to tackle a lot of what we used to do in person. Yeah, and I think the truth is there's going to be you know, literally dozens of different kind of hybrid models. I mean, that's the way we're doing. I, I was telling Babs, I said, you know, the transition from 
completely Zoom back to in-person, I said it's going to be about five times more complex than the transition from in-person into Zoom. That happened in three days. When we were back to full schedule, it took two and a half months to make a complete transition. The other thing is a lot of people are romanticizing what in-person was like because they've been away for it for 14 months. And I said, oh, remember when we just said, hey, they're romanticizing. It's like all the fun you had in high school and you go back and you <laughs> you know, there were hormone wars going on, you know. Believe me, my, my wife and I went out to dinner with another couple on Friday night for the first time in, you know, a year and a half in person, inside. You know, I'd gotten pretty used to spending my Friday nights, you know, sitting on the couch reading a book and in my sweats. Yes. It wasn't quite as romantic as I yeah. had imagined it. Now we had a great time. It was great to be together. It was great to get out. But the hybrid model I think is right. You know, I don't plan to do that every in, Friday. In other words, next Friday night you're staying home reading a book and I'm staying, staying home next Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah. But it's hybrid in the sense that it'll be different for different locations, different kinds of organizations. But we have one rule we've announced that we're shooting for October depending on, you know, governmental circumstances and governmental regulations. But we're shooting for October. The team starts coming back in August, okay? We're in three countries, so it's different in three situations. But we have one rule, and it's very, very interesting. On workshop days, everybody's there. When we're having workshops, full staff, everybody's there. And right away, and said, well, you know, I never see the clients. Well, we said, no, but we have a rule on workshop days, everybody's there. <laughs> Look at the schedule. Look at the schedule. You'll see there's some days that have workshops and some days don't have workshops. But you can see already that you have to be a little bit firmer about going back because, well, I kind of like it the way, you know, I'm not. And I said, no. If you're paying your salary, yeah, you can probably make your own judgment. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, we said the same thing June 1st in Ohio. Things are pretty much open, certainly enough to go back to work. And we had built in flex time to begin with, you know, work remote. And this is kind of another one of those things we talked about in the last podcast where we didn't really have to do a lot to really come back in that, like, we already had these things to begin with. And we've never been somebody that was breathing down your back. It was always get your work done. You want to go sit in a coffee shop? So be it. That's fine. But the core is you're in the office starting June 1st. You know, you get your flex time like you had it before. We'll give you a little extra because the world's changed. But we're back to work. We're in the office. I believe it's the best way. And we're going to stand by that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We're not. We actually closed up our offices for good last year. And we have companies all over the world. So for us, yeah. operating in Cloudlandia and virtual and all of our programming suits itself better this way anyway. Yeah. And we've gotten really used to, I think, the accountability and the responsibility and the follow through being done wherever they are. But again, I think our organization and our platform is set up for that. So interesting times ahead. But this who, not how as a free zone strategy, I think it's early. I think the COVID experience the last 12 or 15 months is going to accelerate the availability of who's to get all of the stuff done that we're all trying to get done. And the willingness for people to do that, I think, is only getting uh, stronger each day. Well, the interesting thing about this, as the world gets more technological, there's actually a higher premium for really great human abilities. The value of human abilities goes up exponentially as technology becomes exponentially more useful. I just noticed it with Zoom because Zoom is a full dose of technology that, you know, wasn't chosen. You were more or less forced into it. And I'm just using Zoom because other people use other platforms, but Zoom has captured the spirit of what we're doing here. I've just noticed it around things like people being late. No, where there was a whole language, there was a whole conversation and in person. Oh my God, gosh, you know, they've closed down this road and they've closed down this road. <laughs> and there was a sort of understanding field. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was kind of like a routine. It was like a comedy routine of why you were late. Somebody's late for Zoom and you say, 
Well, you were in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was 20 feet. <laughs> Why were you late? And I just noticed that Zoom cuts you off if you have any excuses why you didn't show up on time, why you didn't show up prepared, why didn't you do what you did. There's a real emphasis. Look, these times together are really precious. Deliver the goods when you get together. And I think that's going to leave a permanent imprint on the most talented people and the most productive teams, I think, are going to follow on from there. Yeah. Biggest insight from today's conversation, Dan? The one thing that I'm really thrilled about is the way that Who Not How has just become a way of talking about things. And in coach settings, the moment you say Who Not How, everybody knows what you're talking about. You know, yeah, that's the biggest thing. I tell you, we've got about 900 reviews on Amazon. It's about 4.6, I think, out of five stars, it's about 4.6. One bad review gave us a one. He said, why do you read the book? The answer's on the cover. <laughs> I said, that's actually a pretty good review. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Brett, your biggest insight? Yeah, I, I like this idea that we started with, which is, you know, what makes you a good who? What qualifies you to be a good who? I think that's really a great reframe and a great question that, we all should be asking, really understanding and being able to articulate what makes me a good person to partner with? What makes me add value? Why would you want to work with me? Well, here's why. It's really like another way to tell somebody, here's my unique ability. And if this isn't a fit for you, then I'm not the right who for you. Yeah. It can kind of work both ways, both to kind of explain and also to kind of weed out what it is that you don't want to do. I really like that idea of being super clear on what makes you a great who. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Dan, you've said it before, so it's definitely not the first time I heard it, but when you describe teamwork internally and the who collaborations externally, I think about the coaches, the associate coaches you've had for the last 25 plus years and how that is a perfect example of, you know, you had an entire coaching team that weren't employees of strategic coach. They were collaborators and partners, but there was teamwork internally to support them. Yeah. And I just think there's something very impactful. I want to unpack it a little bit on subsequent conversations around the kind of organization you need to build to be a good who collaborator. So what kind of internal teamwork do you need and then external who's, but when you really think about some of the growth of strategic coach going back 25 years, it wasn't, you know, you doing all the coaching. It was you building a who network of coaches to coach the material you created in their own unique way. So just interesting dimension I hadn't thought much about before today. The interesting thing is that on average, we have 17 coaches and the average time coaching is about 16 years. So 17 times 16 I've never seen them coach for even a minute. I've never seen any of the coaches coach. Love it. <laughs> never watched a video, never listened to an audio, never seen it. And I said, we have to have a team that selects them, trains them, supports them. And I said, it can't be me. Love it. Love That's it. Great. Amazing, That's great. too. Because I've had the benefit of of learning from some of those coaches. And I can tell you that they're really good at what they do and they're really good at getting your ideas across. And so it's amazing that you've actually not had to put a hand in that. I never knew that. Yeah. The ultimate who's. Yeah. Yep. For yep. you. Great. Yeah. For you. Yeah. And it's binary. It's a hundred percent or it's nothing. You know, it has to be like that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, great yeah, great conversation, Brett. Great to see you. Look forward to seeing you, I guess, in a couple of weeks at our workshop. And Dan, always a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, great to be with you guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Brett. Take care.